I have not seen the other TRX50 motherboards, but here we are once again. Asus has set the standard with their TRX50 Sage Wi Fi. Hey tech people, Real Meltan here. Before we get on to the new motherboard, let's see what else we have inside the motherboard box. In the box, we have two SATA cables, one thermistor cable pack, one CPU 8 pin to PCIe 8 pin cable, one ASUS Wi Fi Q antenna, one M.2 Q latch package, there are two of them in one package, two M.2 rubber packages, one Q connector, one ACC Express activation key card, and one quick start guide. Okay, that's about it. If you want the full guide, you will have to download from the motherboard website. And a point of note here, ASUS did not provide the Gen 4 or Gen 5 Hyper M.2 X16 card with this motherboard. If you want to install more SSDs than what you can on this motherboard, you will have to buy the expansion card separately. But I have a feeling you would see one bundled with the WRX90 motherboards. Alright, let's look at the TRX50 Sage now. First thing to note is a pretty hefty motherboard, similar in size and thickness to the WRX80 Sage. It is also quite densely packed with two VRM fans flanking the CPU socket, multiple PCIe slots, as well as a lot of buttons and headers. Color-wise, as per its namesake, this TRX50 Sage goes for a black color scheme. Unlike the Zenith 2 Extreme, which we have previously seen, this is a workstation motherboard, so there are no other color accents except for the black color scheme. And yes, there are no ARGB or RGB haters on this motherboard. No blink, people. And one more thing to take note, this TRX50 Sage has a unique body shape. Unlike the WRX80 Sage, you can see that it's bigger at the top and slimmer at the bottom. There's a protrusion here to accommodate the multiple power connectors on this motherboard. Do make sure that you have enough clearance from this side of the motherboard to the other components that you may have inside your chassis. Okay, next, you have seen this CPU socket a couple of times. This is the new STR5 socket from which you install the Trapper 7000 CPUs like a 7960X as well as the Trapper Pro 7000 CPUs like a 79 WX. And I don't think this socket works with the Threadripper 5000 CPUs, and I'm not gonna try it. Together with the TRX50 chipset, this board gives you 4 DIMM slots to let you put up to 1TB of DDR5 RAM. But the RAM modules have to have ECC functionality, and they must be registered DIMMs or R DIMMs. Your non R DIMMs, like this mainstream GSQ Z5, are not going to fit into these DIMM slots. You can see a difference in the location of the notches between these two RAM modules, so don't try to force your non R DIMMs into these DIMM slots. So, before we go on to the other features, I'd like to talk about this chunk of a cooling system. There's a good height for the heat sinks for the center row of VRMs, and the left and right rows each has its own built in 40mm fans. It's a bit hard to see here, but there's a pipe going through the three heat sinks to carry the heat away from the VRMs. I am no overclocker, but it's very amazing to see such a robust active cooling solution on a motherboard like this. From what we have seen so far, the two VRM fans do not spin continuously even on an overclocked 7960X. The VRMs do get really hot, but I think the current cooling setup without the continuous spinning VRM fans is more than enough to carry the heat away from the VRMs. I am not sure what would happen if we put in a 7995WX, but I I'm very sure we can look forward to that. Alright, before we go on to the other big features on this motherboard, I'm just gonna mention some headers and ports which you may want to know. There's quite a few, so here I go. First, you wire up your CPU coolers using the CPU fan headers on the top right. If you have multiple fans, you may want to use this CPU optional fan header. If you have a water block like this AIO, you can use the water pump header over here. ASUS has increased the amperage on these fan headers. So if you are running three Fantex T30 fans at full blast like us, you no longer have to split the load of the three fans onto these two headers. There's enough amperage from one CPU fan header to support the three fans. Next, we have the usual Q diagnostic LEDs which when lit tell you what's wrong with your PC. Below them are points where you use a multimeter to measure the current voltage of your board. This is good to have especially during overclocking just in case you have a certain voltage threshold you do not want to cross. Next for front I.O, there's a USB Type-C 20GB port with power delivery, one USB 5GB port and two USB 2.0 ports. There are four chassis fan headers, one at the left which we use for exhaust and three at the bottom. It would have been nice 
nice to have one header higher up along the right side for the intake fans, but there's just so much going on, I don't think it's possible to do so. Other good to know ports are the TPM header above the left chassis fan header. At the bottom, we have the front panel audio. Skip this first. Q code LEDs, also crucial to diagnose your set. A COM port, a USB header to install a USB 4 card. Um, this tree I won't mention until I have more info. The bot also has a BMC header for you to access the IPMI functions with an external card. Now, let's go back to the skip parts, which I would like to give special mention to. First, the start button. A very essential button to power your set either when you want to test your components or for overclocking. A flex key button, also known as a reset. And these are a retry and save boot button. The retry and save boot buttons are more of overclocking, which allows you to retry if you face a failed overclock. Okay, time for the more interesting parts. Even without the Hyper M.2 card, there are quite a few storage options on this motherboard. There are three M.2 slots, two of which are under this cover, close to the PCH, and the third one is here. You can put Gen 5 SSDs on these two slots, while the third one takes up to a Gen 4 SSD. There are four SATA ports and one Slim SAS slot here. You can install an external NVMe drive using this Slim SAS slot. Okay, next for your GPUs as well as other PCI devices, this TRX50 Sage has quite the expansion. The first two slots are PCIe 5.0 x16, no hardware if you populate both, while the third slot also runs at Gen 5 but at half the speed. The bottom two slots are Gen 4, with the top one running at full speed and the bottom at x4 speed. I will give you a quick tour of possible PCIe configs in the later part of the video. But I have an issue with the PCIe slots, which is the top slot. It is just too close to the VRM heatsink as well as the RAM slot. And because of where the retention clips are, I found it really hard to remove remove the GPU. I will have to remove the bottom RAM module and sometimes both before I could remove the GPU. Hopefully, ASUS can implement their Q release for these two Gen 5 slots in later boards. Okay, so how do you power on all these components? Watch on. This TRS50 Sage supports two power supplies. Yes, you can split your power load with two power supplies. But take note on how you install your power supplies. Let me show you how. First option, if you have a single power supply and the load is not very high, you will use this CPU 8 pin plus PCIe power and this 24 pin. Second option, if you have a much higher power demand like two RTX 4090s but still only want to use one high voltage power supply, you will have to plug into this CPU 8 pin plus PCIe power group on the left as well as a CPU 8 pin plus PCI power group on the right. You will still use this 24 pin to power the board. In addition, you will have to provide power to the PCIe lanes using these two PCIe power in. And that's where I think the CPU power to PCIe adapter will be useful. If your power supply does not have enough PCIe power inputs, you can use this cable so that you can use the CPU power from the power supply instead. And this third option with two power supplies is more complicated, so watch on. With your first power supply, you will connect to the left CPU and PCI power group, the bottom 24 pin as well as the two PCI power in at the bottom right. Your second power supply will use the right CPU power and PCI power group as well as the top 24 pin. That's about it. So if you're able to afford it, go for this dual power supply setup. It may be more expensive, but you are able to split your power load between two power supplies. And we no longer have to use this 24-pin extension cable splitter to connect up both power supplies, which is one less step for yes. cable management. Okay, let's go on to the back I.O. Starting with a clear CMOS button, there's also a BIOS flashback button, a Type-C 20 gig port, the Wi-Fi module for your Wi-Fi 7 antennas, a 10 gig Ethernet port, followed by a 2.5 gig Ethernet port, 6 USB 10 gig ports, and 2 USB 2.0 ports. ASUS has also reduced the number of audio ports similar to the Z790-F Wi-Fi 2 to 2 gold plated audio jacks and 1 SPD out port. I would like to take this chance to show you some possible PCIe configs. If you people ever need more than 3 NVMe SSDs on this board, I got you covered. This is the Hyper M.2 X16 Gen 4 card. I do not have the Gen 5 card, so this will have to do. Okay, config number one, one RTX 4090. You can use this first Gen 5 slot and you have the two bottom Gen 4 slots available. You can either put a USB 4 expansion card or this Hyper M.2 in this top Gen 4 slots. I think you can put something like a sound card or a capture card on this X4 slot. Config number two, there's enough space for two RTX 4090s, but you will not be able to put anything else. Config number three, if this was a Gen 5 card, you can use this top Gen 5 X16 slot and the 4090 can go below it. And you will have these two Gen 4 slots available, sorta. 
it's a bit hard to use this X16 slot unless you can find a thinner RTX 4090. This CRX50 also supports up to 4 GPUs. These are 4 RTX A5000s for example. If you want to have this Hyper M.2 card or USB 4 expansion card, you can still put up to 3 A5000s. Wow, that was a lengthy overview of this TRX50 Sage. As mentioned earlier, ASUS has just set a very high standard for HEDT motherboards. There are a few shortcomings like the PCIe slot, but features like the big active cooling, the multiple PCIe support, as well as the various ports and buttons make this motherboard really good. So if you like my overview of this board, make sure to smash the thumbs up button. If you want to know how a Threadripper performs on this motherboard, you can watch this video here and make sure to come back to my channel for more tech reviews. So stay tuned.